young worship team and their church's pastor is heading on a mission trip to an orphanage. The pastor got a van for all of them to ride together to the orphanage. The worship leader was stressed out about the logistics and fell out of his comfort zone. Two of the girls on the team were on their phones during the whole ride and could not be intentional with their teammates and friends. The pastor had to have a conversation with this young girl. Eventually, they arrived at their mission's destination. As they arrived, kids were so happy to see them. However, many kids were off by themselves and had no one looking after them. Many kids were not taken care of. The pastor realized that he had to yet again confront someone about this situation. He was feeling overwhelmed and felt that he was taking care of all other people but not himself. Hi, I'm an orphan. I was orphaned at age four and now I'm seven. I'm one of the 150,000 kids that were saved from the streets. Even though the streets were bad, I have experienced loneliness like I never have before. Whenever I feel lonely, I cry, and no one notices me because I'm a troubled child, but not as bad as others. I also struggle to make relationships because of where I grew up. I'm emotionally neglected because of my crying and hypersensitivity. I get bullied. They always make your mom jokes, and I hate it because I don't even have a mom. <laughs> Connor, how is worship ministry going for you, man? Uh, you know, all in all, I'm enjoying it, uh, but it can definitely be pretty stressful. I feel like there's a lot on my plate, and I'm struggling to keep up with the demands of the job. So what do you think is really bothering you? <laughs> to be honest, um, you know, I didn't feel like I was mentored in Tower Rec before I got a job here. Uh, and these first couple months have, been, have just been super stressful. I thought I was ready. Now that I've been here, I realized that no one taught me what the ministry side of this was going to be like. I thought I was just going to play music every Sunday, choose the music, and be on the dope team. But I really have to serve and be intentional about the ministry. I'd hate to be one of the 48% that quits because of the demands of ministry. Uh, I wish someone would ask me how I was doing. Otherwise, I would also end up in the 42% of pastors who want to quit because their job is so overwhelming and they're facing the burnout. All right. So my presentation is on uh, kind of developing worship leaders and uh, just kind of what goes with that, what is wrong, what can be done better. Um, so the average age, so kind of the need to develop, the average age of a worship leader or pastor in the United States is actually 50 years old, which I thought that was super surprising because, um, I mean, I've never been to a church personally that has a worship leader that, like, even, like, half that age is generally what I'm used to, but I was surprised to see that. and. Um, I think it definitely, I mean, the, the age to retire eligible age is 62, so, and obviously careers in ministry aren't incredibly long, so uh, there's definitely a need to develop because the careers um, are potentially coming to an end, especially at 50. Um, but contemporary Christian music also <coughs> is taking over congregational worship, uh, super popular kind of among a younger crowd. Uh, everybody knows, like, the artists. Um, Phil Wickham, Brandon Lake, all these big time uh, contemporary worship artists, and we want to hear that music in church. Uh, it's just not stuff, it's not as traditional, it's not stuff that maybe the 50 year old worship pastor or leader is used to. Um, and obviously, as it is to me, and I'm sure it's important to all you guys, worship is just super important to a ton of believers. Um, it's just, to me, it's, uh, it's a super impactful and meaningful way of how I'm able to spend time with the Lord and just kind of encounter Him and sit with Him. Um, also, worship leaders, on average, usually only serve at their church for only one to two years, uh, which is also just kind of a really surprising fact. Because um, churches I've been to uh, definitely have a little bit more longevity, but when it's only one to two years, it's clearly there's something going on, um, and there's something. But 48%, um, a bunch of former worship pastors, leaders were interviewed. 48% uh, of those who quit said that it was because of the demands of ministry. Maybe they just didn't expect all that to come with it. Um, so what can be done better, what needs to be done better so that 
these sports classes can have more success. Um, I think definitely better mentoring and shepherding. I had the opportunity to be mentored really well and feel like I'm in a good place for hopefully when I step into this career one day. Um, they need to be prepared for the ministry side of things because it's a lot bigger than just standing on stage every Sunday. Um, you really have to care for people, be intentional. You're also a, you know, a member of that church. Um, there needs to be better relationships with that worship leader or pastor. Um, if they're only serving for a year or two, it clearly means that they just don't feel super connected with the church and they don't have any reason to stay beyond that. Um, and so that 48 or close to 50% don't continue to quit. Um, there needs to be kind of a success plan in place where their role kind of clearly laid out so that they can be prepared for the ministry demands and the church just needs to do a better job of preparing them. Um, and a couple of verses just about the importance of theologically, or biblically about worship. Um, Isaiah 25, 1, O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Plans for the bold, uh, faithful, and sure, uh, and I can just skip over that too, so, yeah. I'm too nervous to talk to any of the people on this team, so I'll simply go on my phone and pretend that I'm busy so I do not have to talk to anyone. Let me check Instagram real quick. <gasps> no! I lost a follower! <laughs> no one will think that I'm popular anymore. In an age where popularity <coughs> status is determined by followers and having the newest phone model, I am doomed with only 200 followers and an iPhone 13 instead of the 14 Pro! Ugh, everyone lives a better life than me. Why am I always so lonely? I wish I wasn't part of 85% of kids with only smartphones. Or at least that was the number back in 2015. Now everyone has a smartphone. No one wants to talk about real things anymore. I'm so stressed. But I can't text someone back because it will set off my parents' monitoring service and they'll take my phone away. I know I'm probably addicted to my phone. And that everything I'm exposed to is causing me mental distress and sending my anxiety through the roof. But I just can't bring myself to get off social media. I mean, if I wasn't constantly on my social media, I might lose followers, or worse, my streak. I feel so depressed. But then I gain a follower and I feel fine for a while. I guess I have social media friends, but do they really care? Hmm. I have made a lot of new online friends at least. Since I do not know anyone here, I will text one of them. I also appreciate that I can make plans with the friends I already have so quickly. Speaking of that, I'm going to text my non-online friends from home right now and ask if they want to hang out after I get back from their mission trip. I'm done dealing with strangers. Guys, get off your phones. I only communicate with people whose lifestyles match their words and faith. Ugh, the church is the worst. Christians are the worst. <laughs> I wish I felt like I could approach them with my questions and doubts. I don't feel comfortable talking with them after how I saw after I saw how they treated my friend. Maybe I don't want anything to do with this Jesus guy. Alright. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the impact of cell phones on teenagers' pure relationships. So here's just like some overview of effects. So on my research, I found that there were both positive and negative effects, and that the negative effects mainly arose out of when teenagers were overusing their phones or depending on the phones, which is a large percentage of teenagers that all claim to be addicted to their phones. Um, but just some positive effects, so you can connect with more people. So as you saw on the skit, I had so many online friends. Um, and then also just flexibility with making plans, and this wasn't really positive or negative, but um, phones have just kind of impacted how status is determined. So if you have the newest phone model or if you have a lot of followers on Instagram, things like that can change <coughs> popularity status. And then some negative effects is it can lead to only surface level connections when you're just talking with your online friends. And also social isolation because you're just spending all of your time on your phone and not with others. And then also social anxiety, which I found was really interesting because teenagers won't want to talk to anybody new, and so if they're in a social, social situation where they don't know anyone, they'll choose to go on their phone so they look busy and don't have to talk to anyone. And that can make it even more anxiety-ridden to have to talk to people. Um, so just some theories. 
with this is that phones have led to a decrease in face-to-face -face communication. Again, that kind of ties into going on their phones instead of talking to people in these situations. And then it is also a theory that we can be addicted to our phones just like we are addicted to physical sub substances like drugs or alcohol. And some ministry applications, so specifically for youth ministry because that's my major and also I research the effect on teenagers specifically. So I think a big one is just to encourage teenagers to use their phones for good because there are positive effects that can come out of using your phone. And going along with that, like teaching biblical principles as they relate to cell phone usage because cell phones are a lot, such um, a big part of teenagers' lives. So things like be slow to speak and quick to listen, like applying that to your phone when you're texting people or making comments on Instagram. And then also incorporating cell phones into ministry, so maybe like creating a Spotify playlist for your youth group or doing a Bible plan together. And then also just giving up students opportunities to get away from their phones so they don't build that dependence on their phones. So maybe you um, have them put their phones in a bucket during the youth group. Mm -hmm. So my focus was young adults and youth of church, and I, I did the interview route, so I interviewed three different friends of mine. Um, one was, so they were all in their like 20 to 25 range, and then I did two people that like are consistent um, churchgoers, and then one friend who's actually part of the LGBTQ plus community, because I was really interested, like, what does the church sound like to you specifically, and I wanted to learn more about like her specific church hurt. So that's kind of like the context of my interviews. Um, I just kind of highlighted some specific themes that I found in my research. Um, three out of five young Christians disconnect permanently or for an extended period of time from church after 15. And then I also found that a recurring theme was like church isn't a safe space for doubts and questions and so in the young adult community a lot of us are like wrestling with faith and that sort of thing and uh, research shows that young adults don't really feel safe with asking the hard questions in a church setting and then also um, I did like look into okay does like lighting, atmosphere, even like temperature of the building, like very like physical attributes of a church building and how that affects young adults and if they're drawn in. Because a lot of times people think, oh, it has to be good worship. But research showed me that it is a relational issue at the core because uh, young adults want that connection with the people in the church. And I think also it's wise to say that young adults aren't like, they're deeper than that. They don't just want flashy lights on a stage. And so um, I found that interesting. And then, again, questions and doubts. Um, I found it interesting with like older believers responding to the younger generation and not providing a safe environment or just like being condescending. And like often like lecturing them rather than like encouraging them in their faith. And then, yeah, um, research showed that like young adults' relationships within the church affected their church involvement, which very much don't make sense. Like if you find connection, you're gonna wanna get involved in a small group, that sort of thing. And then this quote really stood out to me, nothing will make you lose trust faster with young adults than promising something you don't deliver. Um, <clears throat> and then um, just the poll, some of the top things that uh, would draw or keep young adults at church is community, social justice, depth, and mentorship. And then I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but a lot of people reject Jesus because of their experience with Christians. And so I'm, that's something I'm passionate about, and so that's why I was drawn to this specific topic. And um, kind of mentioned this in the skit, but um, my view towards Abby as the pastor was like, oh, if you're a hypocrite, why would I listen? And so a lot of young people match that with the people in the church. Like, your actions aren't lining up with what you're saying. Like, why would I want to listen or go 
orchard. And yeah, and then um, a big thing, Acts 20, 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And what stood out to me was it literally says all the flock. And I feel like the church can be very um, exclusive and just be like, okay, we're only going to love a group of you and not be kind to everyone and not be welcoming to everyone. Um, and then just some of my interviews, um, some recurring themes in all three uh, were politics and just like the way that they're brought into church hypocrisy, Christian, and more specifically, white superiority, uh, approach to matters of mental health, kind of like the pray your anxiety away type of environment, uh, lack of authenticity, harm to marginalized people groups, and then silencing of questions and doubts. And then uh, a lot of those sounds negative, but I did also, like positives were, one of my interviewees expressed how her parents' role in her childhood really encouraged her like when she got to college to like want to be involved in the church and um and then she mentioned that having more role models when she was younger would have like helped that so like youth group leaders and that sort of thing um and then i just wanted to um emphasize some things that um of my interviews said um, that really stood out to me and my friend in the LGBTQ plus community um, this really stood out to me and she just explained how like if there was a tornado in her town the last place she'd go is a church to like help and I like asked her more about that and she's like I'd go to a non-religious nonprofit because there's no strings attached uh, you're not trying to convert people and this really stood out to me. She goes, I just want to help my community. Uh, Jesus didn't say, come to my church. He said, I'm going to hang out with people and love them. And I was like, huh, interesting. <laughs> so Perfect. like that was like one aspect. And then um, another interviewee just talked about, um, she's very passionate about marginalized people groups. And she was like, why is something I love, aka the church, hurting people I love? And so that just stood out to me as well. Um, and yeah, so I thought it was a very interesting process, and uh, it taught me a lot about just the positives and negatives of church life with young adults. Alright guys, we're going to skip back a bit here because I kind of forgot to set. <laughs> All right, guys, the orphanage is here. Let's get out. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> Why is anyone asking me how I'm doing? I have to ask them about their life, how they're doing. I guess everybody probably just assumes that everything is okay with me, because I guess I'm a pastor. 
have to put on a happy face, pretend everything is fine, and even though I'm facing a burnout, we're really thinking about quitting, I'm just emotionally exhausted by putting on a face to not be able to talk about my problems, and I think I'm not able to give my full attention to my family. Maybe I need to draw a healthy boundary line between my church family and my family to give my attention to my family when they need it. Otherwise, I would end up like this one guy that I read on this book where the congregation voted against um, him having strong boundaries. I think I need to just reconsider what I'm going through and look at this less as a job and more like a unique calling from God. Because in Colossians 3, 23, 24, it says, whatever you do, do it for the Lord and not for men. And to work from the rest Jesus has given, according to Matthew 11, 28. I think I need to submit my work to God and bring it back to him. I need to give him myself, give myself grace because it is only by grace I can be sustained. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice job. Okay, well, let's keep going. Yeah. There's about 20 minutes for everyone. We're doing good transitions right now, so we just got to go. Did you, did you guys want to answer any questions or no? Yeah, there's only one group left. All right.